And this evening we have another wonderful speaker with us and I'm going to introduce Father Leon Strider who is a professor of theology here at St. Mary's in the Graduate School of Theology of the University of St. Thomas as well. Father Strider is principally a professor of liturgy and sacraments and it's a delight for me to invite him up here to, in, uh, to introduce our speaker. Father Leon. Thank you, Father Nesti. I think the main reason I'm here is to prove to all of you that liturgists and scripture people can get along. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, it is a delight for me to introduce uh, Sister Caroline. You know her as doctor as well. She is a religious of the Sacred Heart, and there's about six or seven of them here. These are the beautiful sisters who teach over at Duchenne, our neighbor right down the road and uh, I'm always delighted to be sharing with them. She, uh, of course, Dr. Carolyn finished her studies at Harvard, her PhD. She's dealt with Catholic seminarians and, and religious at CTU in Chicago, she told me, for about 26 years. Got too cold for her. So she moved down to TCU in Fort Worth at the Bright School of Divinity and has been teaching divinity students for the last number of years. And I am so jealous. She is retiring at the end of this year and is going to become an archivist. And so I'm putting some thoughts in my head. What do I want? No, anyway, we are so, she has been teaching Paul, especially these last years, living, praying, studying, uh, and we are just so delighted to have her to come to share with us her Paul through her eyes, through her love. So let's give a warm Texas welcome to Sister Carolyn. Thank you very much, Father Leon. I, I understand now that anything that is said in conversation to him will come out at the microphone. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one a member of it. God has placed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then works of power, spiritual gifts of healing, gifts of helping, gifts of leadership, and gifts of tongues. We began last year in 2008 to celebrate the year of St. Paul, and I asked myself in preparation for this talk, why now? I wasn't sure, so I thought I'd check. The traditional year of his death is 68. That is the year that he's certainly dead by 68. We don't know exactly which year he died. Well, that was 1940 years ago, so that seemed to be a strange way to, to celebrate a year of Paul. Rather, I discovered we're celebrating the bimillennium of the, the presumed year of Paul's birth in the year eight. Well, we really don't know exactly the year of his birth or of his death, but yeah, why not celebrate? It's a good time to celebrate Paul, this amazing person. So why do we celebrate Paul? Well, because his writings are in the Bible, but then that forces the question, why are they in the Bible? And the answer to that is that he wrote many letters, though he probably wasn't alone in doing that, among the m many itinerant missionaries who were circulating in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. But in his letters, the recipients found something worth saving, and indeed worth sharing with others. So some early Christians began to gather Paul's letters into collections. For instance, we know of two such networks, one between Corinth and Rome at the end of the first century, and another between Philippi and Smyrna in the second century. These collections formed probably the earliest components of what today we know as the New Testament. Since we have no witness to a collection of gospels until about half a century later in the late second century, Irenaeus, 
in the late second century in his ingenious way tells us that just as there are four winds and four corners of the earth, so there are only four gospels that we accept. And he's saying that against other gospels that are being circulated by others. Around the same time, the so-called Moratorian Canon, which is a, a list in Latin of uh, acceptable books in the church, lists 13 Pauline letters, all of them that are in our present collection except Hebrews. So by that time, the, the collection of Paul's letters was well established. And of course, these letters were written to specific people for specific purposes at specific times, answering specific questions and problems. Paul did not intend them for future readers. So we have to be aware that when we read them, as someone has said, we're reading somebody else's mail. And yet early on, they were seen to contain elements that transcend those specific times, places, and problems. Paul is an apostle for all seasons and for our day too, but not everyone loves Paul. Many people don't like him now and many people didn't like him during his lifetime. Some Jews still blame him for turning the movement of Jesus against Judaism, or at least away from it, and believe that it, if it hadn't been for Paul, we would all be Jews today. There is something to that argument in that there was a historic turn that was inevitably happening already uh, in the first century, whereby what was to become Christianity turned away from its Jewish roots. Some elements of Paul's theology helped facilitate that movement. And he was in a way a spokesperson for it uh, and, and the theological, uh, uh, leader, but it's too simplistic to blame it all on Paul. Th this was a movement that was inevitable anyway. Some women thinks, uh, think Paul that it is a male chauvinist. And again, there are difficult sayings about women attributed to Paul, not all of which I think he said, but some he definitely did. I don't find him any more misogynist than most other male writers of his day, which is not saying a whole lot. In this question, as in all questions of biblical interpretation, I hold that the problem is not what Paul said. The problem is how what Paul said is later used. There are others who only get snippets of Paul's writings in the second lectionary reading on Sundays and would readily agree with the author of the second letter of Peter that, quote, our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom that was given to him as he speaks about this in all his letters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the uneducated and unstable twist for their own destruction." Unquote. So already in the New Testament we have someone saying, he's not always easy to understand. Indeed, Paul is not always easy to understand, either then or now. Besides the enormous time separation of 2,000 years, there are all the differences of culture and mentality, and that would take another whole lecture to elucidate. And then there are others who really understand Paul's vision and fear it because it's so radical and we can never live up to it. I think Paul himself understood that. The kind of vision that he articulates, for instance, in his letter to the Galatians was clearly not lived up to in his community in Corinth. One of the difficulties in the letters, though, is that we only have his frustrated and angry articulation in Galatians, and we have no evidence for what was really going on in Galatia or how the Galatians received his letter. In the Corinthian correspondence, we have Paul dealing with some very real problems on the basis of the vision of his vision that is already assumed in 2 Corinthians, we even see the revolt against Paul's authority that has happened there in Corinth. But we wish we had the nitty-gritty kinds of reporting for Galatia that we have for Corinth. And even so, in every case, we have the, the church's response to Paul. We have Paul responding to situations. We don't know what was really going on in those situations beyond his perception and the things that got reported to him. Then he responds to the situation, and then we don't know how they responded to 
his response. Paul's vision was intensely Christological and intensely social. It was formed as the result of some kind of what we would call a mystical experience or a religious experience. And he called it a personal encounter with the risen Christ. As a result, Paul understood that everything significant in his life from now on had to do with his rootedness in the presence of Christ Jesus living in him so that he could say, I live no longer I, but it is Christ who lives in me. His vision was also intensely social. It was not about individual salvation, as it was sometimes portrayed by the 16th century reformers and is so often portrayed in our 21st century North American individualist culture. Rather, it was about our being in Christ together living and proclaiming the vision of what Christ has done for us and for the whole world. What do we know of Paul's life? The primary source is his letters, but there are two other sources. One is Acts of the Apostles, and the third is a second century non-canonical text called the Acts of Paul. From Paul himself, we know that he was circumcised on the eighth day, born of Israel, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, so he had all the right credentials. In adulthood, by choice, he was a Pharisee, and he himself tells us that. One of that group within the Israel of the day that strived to bring about a religious renewal based on new interpretations of tradition. Don't believe the bad image that the Pharisees have in the Gospels. It's unfair to the Pharisees. He also states here that he had a clean, a clear conscience with regard to observance of the moral and ritual law of Moses. Greek was probably his first language, and his letters show evidence of a good education in rhetoric. From Acts of the Apostles, we learn that he was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, we're there, in uh, Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. Tarsus was a city with a strong reputation for learning. It was a university town. In Acts, Paul also makes a point of the fact that he was a Roman citizen from birth. How that came about is not clear. Jerome, in the fourth century, may preserve a historical memory, and it's one that certainly makes sense, when he says that Paul's parents were from Gishala in southern Galilee. They were slaves of a Roman citizen and then manumitted. Under most conditions, especially in the early years of the Roman Empire, slaves that were properly legally manumitted by a Roman citizen became themselves Roman citizens, and that passed down to their children then. So that is probably the best explanation of Paul's Roman citizenship. In Acts, Paul also says that he was brought up in Jerusalem and studied biblical exegesis there with Gamaliel, who was one of the great uh, Jewish teachers of the day. So over down here. And the, the red points, if you can see the red ones, are in fact places where Paul is known to have been all the way through Macedonia, Corinth, Athens, and then of course, and then uh, the shipwreck, uh, or the passing through here, and Malta and Rome are off the map there. Paul may have had extended family in Jerusalem as an adult, because in Acts, his nephew, his sister's son, appears at one point in the story and is called a young man. From both Paul's letters and Acts, we learn that Paul was a persecutor of the way, as the group of followers of Jesus were called in the early church. His zealous attention to do the religiously right thing brought him into conflict with this new group of what we might call Jews for Jesus, who seemed to be a threat to all that he held sacred. But at some point, as we know, Paul experienced the risen Christ. Acts describes it as a dramatic encounter on the road between Jerusalem and Damascus. There. 
in which he was knocked to the ground, saw a bright light, and heard a voice with which he conversed, and then was blind for a few days. These are two famous artistic depictions of the conversion of Paul, of that encounter on the Damascus Road. The first one by Michelangelo, of course, has to have the, the, the real Michelangelo God, you know, reaching out to do something uh, with a line, uh, he's being zapped straight down uh, to Paul lying on the ground. And probably uh, the image here is Christ because of the, of the narrative in which he is actually talking with Christ. And there's a horse galloping away. Caravaggio's depiction is not quite so dramatic, but still there's a horse and Paul is on the ground. And of course, if you read the narrative, it never says there was a horse. <laughs> it just says he was knocked to the ground. But this is the origin of the expression to be knocked off your horse. Paul himself talks about this event far less dramatically. He says things like, when God, who had called me from my mother's womb, which is a not so subtle comparison of himself to Jeremiah, when uh, the God who had called me from my mother's womb chose to reveal the Son in me in order that I might preach him to the nations, to the Gentiles, he's focused there not on what happened to him, but on the purpose of it. Or in Philippians 3, everything I thought was gain, I have come to consider loss for the sake of Christ. He doesn't give such dramatic details as Luke narrates three times in Acts. However this conversion happened, whether quickly or more slowly as befits the usual pace of reintegration after a traumatic experience, he was eventually ready to take on what he felt called to do, to be an itinerant preacher of this good news all over the northeastern Mediterranean for about 15 years. Now, I said there was a third source, the Acts of Paul. The Acts of Paul were written in the next century, and from it we gather some information that is not in the New Testament. We don't know if it is historical, but it has entered in the, into the traditional lore about Paul. First, that he was executed by the sword, which would be the appropriate means of execution of a Roman citizen. That's a privilege you had as a Roman citizen. If they were going to kill you anyway, they'd cut your head off rather than something more awful. Uh, these are two depictions of Paul holding a sword, which I assume comes from the tradition about him being killed by the sword. This one is outside of St. Peter's in Rome, and this one uh, in the courtyard of St. Paul outside the walls, also um, in Rome. Um, and it may be from this tradition that derives the idea that I ran into one time that I had never heard before, that somebody said, is it true that Paul was a Roman soldier? And I just have no idea where that comes from, but maybe it's from seeing these statues with him holding the sword. I don't know. Um, and from the Acts of Paul comes that he was executed by the sword in Rome under the Emperor Nero. And Nero committed suicide on June 9th in the year 68, at the age of 32, saying, as his last words, according to one historian, what an artist dies with me. <laughs> Nero was a great character. But you see, hence the tradition of Paul's death in 68, or sometime before 68. It's really coming out of the Acts of Paul. Second, there is a description of Paul's appearance in the Acts of Paul that's been somewhat normative for visual depictions of him. Short, bow-legged, with eyebrows meeting in the middle, and a reclining uh, hairline. Much of that description we no longer consider flattering. However, the receding hairline has stayed. Uh, and, and these depictions of Peter and Paul together, Peter always has a full head of hair, and Paul always has that reclining hairline. <laughs> the other parts of it, um, the bow leg and, and uh, you know, the eyebrows meeting in the middle, all of that, it's very interesting that research has been done that shows that, that some of that actually was thought of as the sign of a wise person, especially the eyebrows meeting in the middle. And then the receding hairline. Um, 
the description that's given in the Acts of Paul sounds an awful lot like some of the descriptions given of Socrates. The statue at the top is of Socrates. Uh, so that raises the question whether it preserves a historical memory or whether the author intends to make him look like Socrates. We don't know. Paul was not universally loved and appreciated during his lifetime or in the years after his death. For a body of Christian literature from the second or third centuries known as the Clementine Romances, it's a, it's a series of novel, novelistic adventures, Peter is the hero, along with his Roman sidekick, Clement, as they tackle adventures with Simon Magus. Remember Simon Magus from Samaria in Acts, uh, who wanted to be able to, to buy the, the magic, perceived magic power that the apostles had? Well, Simon Magus here uh, gets to Rome and he does latch onto some magic and he uh, gets hold of some wings whereby he is able to fly around in the, in the air in Rome until uh, Peter zaps him and he falls down. So we have stories like that in this uh, collection. But Paul in this collection of novels is the anti-hero who has made everything go wrong. And he has done that by trying to um, sever uh, this movement from Israel, from Judaism. So it's, we're back there to that image of Paul as the one who does that. But we only have to read 2 Corinthians carefully to know that even earlier in Paul's lifetime, not everyone respected him. He repeats the charges in 2 Corinthians. They say he's inconsistent, saying one thing and doing another. They say he's humble face to face, but he's bold when he gets some distance away. They say his letters are weighty and strong, but his physical appearance is weak and his speech is not very impressive. Mm -hmm. So he's better at a distance than he is up close. And what is the meaning of his plaintive remark in Romans 15, 23, that there is no longer any room for me in these regions? He's writing to the Romans. He has never been to Rome. He's, the letter to the Romans is the introduction, self-introduction. And he says, specifically in chapter 15, he's going to Jerusalem to deliver the collection of money he had promised them. And then he's heading west. And he's going to go to Rome and hopes there to collect enough money to get him to Spain. And we don't know whether he ever went to Spain. But saying there's no more room for me in these regions. Um, I don't think he means there is no other possible place to evangelize. Um, I think he means it was getting too hot for him and it's time to get out. That there was too much, he was stirring up too much opposition by what he stood for. And therefore, there was all of the West that was still possible for him. But, of course, as Acts of the Apostles narrates, he never got out of Jerusalem as a free person, uh, but rather as a prisoner. And eventually he did get to his destination of Rome, but not in the way he had planned. By this time we're talking about an old man, perhaps in his 60s, by which time you really were old in those days. Here's Rembrandt's portrait, which I like. I don't think Paul's temperament helped people like him. I suspect that he was not an easy person to get along with. He could express deep affection, but at the same time, he seems to have been a person who was bursting with energy and new ideas, an initiator who had to rely on others to carry out his plans. This kind of personality fit quite well with a vocation of travel, new encounters with new people, and then moving on again to other new situations and people while those behind had to pick up the pieces. Um, and keep things going. When we celebrate Paul, what are we celebrating? A creative and dedicated disciple of Jesus, one of the best theologians in the New Testament, an apostle, a title he insisted on, probably because of the legitimizing connotations that it carried. And I suspect Paul was always plagued by questions about his legitimacy. Today, we first connect the word apostle with the 12, but it's not at all clear that during the lifetime of Paul, the 12 apostles 
uh, was a title. The 12, yes, apostles, yes, but that they were put together, not so sure. There were others who were called apostles, and they all seem to have been itinerant missionaries delegated by specific churches. Paul cannot be celebrated apart from Christ. We celebrate Paul, but he would never have been happy to be celebrated alone or for his own sake. His life was centered on Christ as the one who had taken hold of his life, to such an extent that he could say, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. When we speak of Paul's mysticism, this is what we mean, or at least what I mean. There's a paradox here. Paul, the New Testament writer who lived chronologically closest to the terrible events of the death of Jesus, even though he was not an eyewitness, he yet lived at a time when it would have been the most difficult to see those events with any amount of theological abstraction because they were so close. And yet he's the best one able to incorporate their meaning into his own life in a very graphic way by saying that he is crucified with Christ. After 2,000 years, we've heard that so often that we, we give our own meaning to it. But can you imagine how, how earth-shaking it was to be able to use that kind of language, something like um, 15, 20 years after the death of Jesus, in which, at a time when crucifixion is still an, an ordinary means of execution, too. It, it is really quite surprising. For Paul, Christ is now the fulfillment of all the promises of the law made by God to Israel. In Christian tradition, Paul stands for the admission of Gentiles, that is, non-Jews, into the Messianic community. It's important to realize that this possibility was already there. Paul did not invent that. Second Temple Judaism, that, that is Judaism of the time of Jesus and Paul, was quite open to the admission of Gentiles into Israel through conversion becoming proselytes, or as observers in the synagogue liturgy. And this is probably what is meant by God-fearers in Acts of the Apostles. The images from 3rd Isaiah of all the nations flocking to Jerusalem were very much in mind. For example, Isaiah 66, I am coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. They shall bring all your people from all the nations as an offering to the Lord to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. So the openness of Israel to the Gentiles was not invented by Paul. The prophet Joel had prophesied a universal outpouring of the Spirit in a text that later Luke uses for Pentecost. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young people shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. So there was no problem with Gentiles entering into the promises of Israel, as long as they then observed the laws and customs of Israel. What Paul did was to reset the boundaries and the center. For Paul, Jerusalem and Israel are no longer the center. Christ is the center. And Christ is not located in any one place. The death of Christ is the hilasterion, the atoning sacrifice that repairs the damage done by Adam. Abraham is the ancestor of all who believe in God. Paul's teaching on justification by faith is not an esoteric theology about sin, law, grace, so much as it is a pastoral problem to be solved theologically how to get Jews and Gentiles to eat together, to sit down together at the same table for the Lord's Supper. If Christ is who Paul says he is, then nothing else is needed for salvation except incorporation into Christ. Then the law, good as it was, has been superseded by Christ, and grace and access to salvation are available to all regardless of status or qualifications. <laughs> 
Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, as goes the famous statement in Galatians 3.28. But if Paul cannot be celebra celebrated apart from Christ, he also cannot be celebrated apart from the communities in which he invested all his time and energy. And here we're not talking about a distinctively different thing than Paul's incorporation into Christ. Once when writing to the Corinthians with what we call a catalog of sufferings, he says, I was five times flogged, three times beaten, once stoned, three times shipwrecked, dan with danger on land and danger at sea, he adds, and besides all this, there is the daily anxiety for all the churches. The members of these churches were the ordinary people of the cities of the Eastern Roman Empire. Merchants, craftsmen, craftswomen, freedmen and freedwomen, and slaves. They lived and met in households and in rented spaces. They were Jew, Greek, Roman, and from many other minority ethnic groups, slave and free, male and female, trying to make a living, raising their children, trying to find happiness. Many other competing unofficial religions also promised happiness beyond this life. But Paul's version of the death of Jesus as redemptive sacrifice and God's vindication of that sacrifice by raising Jesus from the dead was highly appealing. And we are invited to participate in that mysterious dying and rising through baptism, Eucharist, and living it out in our lives. Some of the people from these communities joined full time in the itinerant process of evangelization we know some of their names. Barnabas, who was at this before Paul. Timothy, Silvanus, Epaphroditus. The missionary couple Prisca and Aquila, who turn up in Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus, and back in Rome again. The apostolic couple Andronicus and Junia. And others were closely associated with his work, even though they have been, may have been more residential, or they were more residential. For instance, in Acts of the Apostles, there are characters like Mary, the mother of John Mark, who hosts a house church in Jerusalem, Lydia, the merchant of purple dyed cloth in Philippi. Many of these moved along while doing their trade and practiced evangelization in the workshop, including Paul, according to Acts. The, the workshop seems to have been a basic center for evangelization, and we get that uh, testified by um, a hostile writer, Galen, uh, in the second century, who says that these people, these Christians, go after the uneducated and simple people in the workshops. But many of Paul's friends and collaborators, the members of his community, we will never know their names. For all of them, however, he posed his challenge of evangelization. This is the very radical vision of Paul that if we are incorporated into Christ, then the spirit of Christ dwells in us and we do not need law to know right from wrong. He spells that out in Galatians 5, where he writes that spirit and flesh are opposed to each other, but note his listings of the works of the flesh, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. He calls them obvious, and some are what we might expect, fornication, impurity. But also there is jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, and envy. Here we have a portrait not of life according to what we might want to call flesh, but rather according to the restless instincts of those who do not know how to relate humanly before God with one another. What Paul usually means by flesh, and very de definitely does in this context, is not matter or body, it's resistance to God. And a lot of that is not material. But now note what Paul calls the fruits of the spirit in contrast to the works of the flesh. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He remarks dryly, against these there is no law. Here Paul depicts what happens in a community of persons who live by the Spirit. How are they expected to change their behavior because of their new faith? We see some of the problems, 
and Paul's expected outcomes in 1 Corinthians 5 to 11. Some of these issues are no surprise, but some are. Avoidance of sexual irregularities, mutual respect in marriage, a preference against divorce based on the saying of the Lord, and a new look at celibacy because the time is short. But there are others there in that list. It makes no sense, he says, for brother or sister to bring lawsuits against one another. Wouldn't that be a twist? One's own freedom to eat anything can be freely given up for the sake of another who has not yet come to that freedom. The integrity of the Lord's Supper is compromised if there is not sensitive mutual respect for all who partake, especially those of more humble means. Later, there would be other questions arising, one of them being, but, and never resolved, whether Christians could serve in the military, largely because of necessary religious ceremonies, or whether they could attend the games in the amphitheater, the equivalent of sports events. But those are questions that Paul did not yet raise. But these issues that are raised by Paul and raised by the Corinthians in his time raised the question, how different were Christians expected to be? Some authors of the following century argue that they were not at all different from the rest of society, except that they did not, um, they, they, they raised all their children who, who were born, and um, that they uh, did not practice divorce, though there's evidence that some did practice divorce. These arguments are usually intended for outsiders and advanced when the author is attempting to make the point that Christians should not be considered a threat. At the same time, Christian authors will argue the advantages of being Christian and how Christian's behavior is in sharp contrast to others. It depends on which point you're trying to make. The famous saying, see how these Christians love one another, is actually part of Tertullian's clever way of asserting the superiority of Christians. The full saying goes like this. They, the, the pagans, the others, say, look how these Christians love one another because they themselves hate one another. And how they, the Christians, are ready to die for each other because they themselves are ready to kill each other. Paul's vision of community was that of community in mission. To begin with, he had an advantage that we in our kind of society do not have. Cultural anthropologists describe sociocentric or collectivist versus egocentric or individualist societies. A sociocentric society is one in which the common good takes precedence over consideration of the individual. Protecting the cohesion, security, and honor of the group sometimes means sacrificing the rights of an individual. The group protects its members and expects absolute loyalty in return. This doesn't mean that no individual can act on their own initiative, simply that there's heavy social pressure to conform and the price of deviance is high. By contrast, an egocentric society gives much heavier weight to individual rights and assumes or hopes that if all individuals are free to exercise their rights, the good of the whole will be the result. Obviously, our Western societies as a whole are egocentric or individualist giving primacy to individual preferences and rights over duty to the common good. It's been asserted that a primary foundation of modernity since the 16th century is the unusual belief that the person is the primary unit of society rather than the group. Even in the most individualist society, however, there are pockets of sociocentrism, for example, sports teams, street gangs, teenagers, that's why you can't get along with your teenager. As many students of culture realize, the clash between these two understandings of society is part of, is part of many of the political problems today in international relations. The argument is made that, since this, that, that before the 16th century in Europe, there were no egocentric societies and that even today individualism is a rather peculiar idea within the context of world cultures. So when it comes to formation of community, Paul's communities have one advantage over us. They are sociocentric groups that can more easily look to the common good 
than a society like ours that first looks to the autonomy and rights of the individual. The problem in a sociocentric community is not individual deviants, but factions, splinter groups. They existed in Paul's Corinth, for he says, some say I belong to Paul, some say I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. And he says, is Christ divided? Did Paul uh, baptize you? Uh, were you baptized into Paul? You may have noticed that most of Paul's letters have unity as a main focus. It's quite explicit, for example, in 1 Corinthians and Philippians. Paul's challenge for the building of community was not to enlist individuals in the common effort, but to convince groups that they wanted what he wanted and that they could work together. Paul's chosen word for community is ecclesia, borrowed from civic language to refer to an assembly of citizens, a gathering in which all have voice. It's, it's an interesting choice of words. He could have chosen synagogue, synagogue, which was already in use. Um, and both words mean an assembly of people, but he chose ecclesia, which has a more civic connotation. In 1 Corinthians, he uses a series of images for the church. The community is God's field, God's building. The community is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And only after that will he say that each person is the temple of God. The community is one body because it shares the one bread. And finally, the image most familiar to us, the community is the body of Christ, the personal presence of Christ in the world. This is the image that forms the shape and identity of the community. It is we who carry on Christ's work in the world. The metaphor of body for a group of people who must cooperate was not original with Paul. It had been used for centuries to speak of various kinds of human groups, armies, cities, other groups expected to work together. Paul adapted it to his vision and what he wanted to say to his people so that they would understand that they were to carry on doing whatever he taught them that Jesus did. Toward the end of 1 Corinthians 12, the same chapter in which Paul has expanded on the body imagery, he then says that God has established in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then acts of power, gifts of healing, of assistance of leadership, and finally the gift of tongues. All are charisms, charismata, for building the community. I've often pondered why Paul numbers the first three gifts which he does specifically as if in a pecking order of some sort. First apostles, and of course, that's what he considers himself to be. Second prophets, third teachers. And as a teacher, I kind of take exception to that. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion, however, that the order and numbering is not so much an order of importance in some, some sort of hierarchy as it is an order of process for how community is built. It takes first the effort of the apostle, the initiator, the one capable of inspiring people with a message that will unite them and enable them to find a common cause. Second comes the prophet. Prophets ratify or critique what has been done. They keep us on track with the Holy Spirit or call us to task when we stray. Prophets interpret what will be in the light of what is and what has been. The task of prophets is to assess and evaluate in the light of God's desires for us. In doing that, they often stir up controversy and cause people to question what they've taken for granted as right. It's interesting to note that when discussing speaking in tongues, Paul comments that he does that very well, thank you. But he never calls himself a prophet, though he does let slip a casual comparison of his call with that of Jeremiah. Third comes the teacher who carries through systematically, day after day, with the solidification of what the people have learned. The teacher is the one who can lay the firm foundation of appreciation of the tradition, 
and anchor the life of faith in what has gone before. Paul does not call himself a teacher either. Though he is called by that title in what we assume to be later writings in Paul's name, where he has the same three titles in two different passages in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. But then, there are all kinds of other gifts that come tumbling from Paul's pen for the building up of the community. It's not an exhaustive list, but a suggestive one, full of those who give comfort, for example, healers, those who lead, those who have the gift to play second fiddle. All cannot have the same role to play, but it's the complementarity of gifts that produces the vital community that is the body of Christ, which evangelizes the world through its daily witness and its interaction with others. That witness and interaction take place, of course, within a certain cultural milieu, just as the actions of Jesus and Paul did in their own cultures of rural Galilee and Roman cities, which were not at all the same. There have been many attempts to define culture and many discussions of whether Christianity can exist in some kind of pure form distinct from the cultures in which it arose or in which it lived. I'm not going to try to do either. Culture is too slippery to be neatly defined. As was once said of something quite different, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. It is theoretically possible that the message of Christianity could be somehow extracted from culture, but it doesn't seem that anyone has succeeded in doing so. We like to think of the gospel as independent of culture, but the expression of it can only be done through human words and deeds, and therefore necessarily from within a specific culture. We know that even mystics are highly influenced by culture in their interpretation of what they see and hear. Paul absorbed from his encounter with the risen Christ and from his contacts with those who had known Jesus, what he absorbed was deeply embedded in his own cultural presuppositions, as also was the way that he preached the message and the ways in which it was received. What I do wish to do, however, in the final part of this presentation is to offer some reflections on how Paul would have seen Christ interacting with culture, how Paul did it, and what clues we might take home about it. This is always a crucial question. To what extent does the Christian participate fully in the world around us, and to what extent do we say no to certain elements of that world? It must be acknowledged that there is an important difference. Paul's communities were in a minority position with no chance to exercise any kind of political influence. Our situation in that regard is quite different. Those who profess Christian faith in the United States are a majority, and some hold a great deal of political power. Yet the call to evangelization recognizes that we live in a society that some call post-Christian, not only because of growing religious pluralism, but more importantly because of growing indifference to the kinds of values that we think faith should stand for. <clears throat> The dialogue between faith and culture has been prolonged and will continue. No one has done a better job of laying out the options than H. Richard Niebuhr in his book long ago, <coughs> Christ and Culture, <clears throat> in 1951, based on lectures delivered in 1949 at Austin Presbyterian Seminary. Niebuhr lays out five positions with regard to the interaction of Christ and culture. First is Christ against culture. This is the position that Christianity stands in opposition to culture and they are irreconcilable, and so Christianity must create its own culture, <clears throat> and that subsequently new Christians must, must give up their own culture to become part of the new Christian culture. <clears throat> he attributes this position among, uh, to, among others, the Gospel of John, Tertullian, and Tolstoy. He recognizes the impossibility of doing it completely and, uh, and that too often those who believe this way and evangelize in this manner simply create clones of their own culture to impose on others. As when missionaries in cultures not yet influenced by Christianity create churches that are as much as possible like what they knew at home. <clears throat> 
This approach can have great appeal to those for whom the experience of conversion means embracing something totally new outside one's own culture even if the result can be familial and social alienation from one's previous life. Niebuhr's second type is Christ with or in agreement with culture. Here Christ represents the best of human achievement. Theology builds on philosophy and the image of Christianity takes on a decidedly rational image. The best impetus to social change occurs here. here for there's optimism about human structures and the possibility of infinite improvement. Christ then is congenial to our culture and poses no threat. What happens as a result is that we tend to construct a Jesus who is very much like us. As Voltaire said, and what's one of my favorite sayings, Dieu a créé l'homme à son image et l'homme ne lui a joliment rendu. God created humanity in God's image and we have returned the compliment. <laughs> Here, Niebuhr would place Abelard and the founding fathers of the United States. He also places here the Christian Gnostics of the early church, but I think he's misunderstood them. After all, he was writing just at the time of the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt, which gave us for the first time an entire literary collection written by the Gnostics themselves. All he had to go on was what their enemies said about them. I would sooner place the Gnostics in the first group, Christ against culture. The third type that Niebuhr delineates is Christ above culture. The church is guardian of culture and uses the best of it to lead to transcendence. Every truly human process leads to God. This is a both and position with a positive view of nature and natural law. The Chalcedonian definition of the two natures of Christ, divine and human, is indicative of this view. The human leads to the divine. Niebuhr finds that this position is represented by Clement of Alexandria, the social teaching of Pope Leo XIII, and is best exemplified by Thomas Aquinas. Niebuhr's fourth type is Christ in polarity or tension with culture. The Christian is a citizen of two worlds. Christ is above culture, but we must live in it. We must hold both together, but distinguish between loyalty to Christ and respect for culture. We're called to be dualist, but not dualistic. There's a struggle between sin and grace, law and grace, wrath and mercy. As you might have guessed, it's here that Niebuhr places Paul, as well as Martian and Luther. I can understand why he does, though I think that as a good Protestant, Niebuhr is reading Paul almost exclusively out of Romans rather than any other Pauline letters. And in Romans, one finds a distinctively different Paul caught up with more theological struggles and tensions than with pastoral problems. Clearly, Romans is Paul's final account, as Christer Stendhal calls it, his chance finally after many years to reflect more systematically on the significance of his teaching but it is one piece of a larger picture of Paul, the apostle and pastor, with his daily concern for all the churches. Finally, there's a fifth type for Niebuhr, Christ transformer of culture. This position is more synthesis than dualist. Creation is the foundation, and it's basically good, not evil, yet it's perverted good. So the solution is conversion transformation. History is therefore closely penetrated by God's action and is the revelation of God acting to transform humanity into the heavenly promise of what it can become. Here the chief proponents are Augustine and Calvin, to whom I would add Théard de Chardin, who was not publishing yet at, at the time of Niebuhr. All of them saw the possibilities of history and saw God present in it to bring it to fulfillment. How did Paul deal with the tension between Christ and culture? For I certainly think he lived in this tension. He was, after all, a member of a Jewish ethnic and cultural minority who were not at all unanimous about issues of identity and accommodation, about how they should live within the larger dominant culture of Hellenism and the growing power of Rome. The Jewish population of Judea was not necessarily more culturally distinct or traditional, traditional than those of the diaspora, the larger Jewish population that lived outside of Judea, spread out from Babylon to Egypt to as far west as Rome and Spain. 
Yet there were varying degrees of cultural accommodation, from the sophisticated Jewish elite of Alexandria to the Pharisees of Judea who attempted to shape a new religious piety. Paul was a Pharisee, we must remember, yet also a product of the diaspora. He had to work out a way of living his faith within the wider culture, yet also how to make his way successfully in that culture. He could define himself according to his religious identity, Hebrew, Israelite, Pharisee. Yet he was free enough to suspend that identity for the sake of others, becoming, as he says in one place, all things to everyone in order to gain at least some. We have seen Paul's radical vision of freedom in the spirit from law as a way of life. Yet sometimes even the greatest thinkers backtrack on their insights and vision when, as the saying goes, the rubber hits the road. So too, I think it was with Paul. In some circumstances, when he saw what could happen when people took him seriously, he backed down into what we might call the conservative or traditional way. Sometimes it's been said that the Corinthians got hold of his letter to the Galatians and ran with it. There's much talk about freedom in the letter to the Galatians, none at all in 1 Corinthians, because the Corinthians had enough freedom. Though he does return to the theme of freedom very briefly in 2 Corinthians. The Corinthians uh, had enough freedom without any urging on Paul's part. The church in the post-Constantinian era began to see itself as patron and guardian of culture in a way that Paul never could have done. Even a quick visit to Rome, and especially to the Vatican Museum, reveals how the entire city was a center of the arts during the time that it was the capital of the Papal States, from the early, early Middle Ages to 1870. By contrast, Paul and his contemporaries lived under the oppressive shadow of Roman imperial power, in which they had no stake, even though they benefited from its open borders and its extensive road system, to be able to travel freely in the Eastern Mediterranean area in a way that's not even possible today. Indeed, it's often been said that the quick spread of Christianity in the first centuries would never have been possible without that amazing road system. So evangelization was made possible in the first Christian generations, not only by culture, but by technology, the new and careful way in which Roman roads were built. The need for the gospel to be proclaimed by means of technology has never ceased since. From the radio, to the television, to the blog spot, to XT3, the Vatican's answer to Facebook and MySpace, with 40,000 members from 200 countries touted as so good the Pope uses it. <laughs> XT3.com. There's a presumed African proverb that has become common here. No one seems to know exactly where it came from. No African place is claiming it, but we've all heard it. It takes a village to raise a child. If this is so, it also takes a community to proclaim the gospel. Evangelization in Paul's churches was not done by enterprising individuals, but by common collaboration, using the best of culture and our best insights about the gospel to critique and transform culture. That, I think, is the only way to practice evangelization effectively. It happens through the initiative of, of apostles, the prodding of prophets, the wisdom of teachers, the ministry of healers, the courage of leaders, and the support of assistants. We don't do it individually, but together. The church is not perfect, as it certainly wasn't in Paul's day. But we are the church who, with God's help, can make it happen. Thank you. First question is, what do you think Paul thought about the, ro the, the role of women in evangelization? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Funny oh. you should ask. And they had, 
And they added thank you. Pardon? And they added thank you. I didn't hear that. And they added thank you to the question. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, what did, role, what did Paul think about the role of women in evangelization? Well, our best evidence for that is the number of women who are named as collaborators uh, of Paul. And you have a, no, a good number of them in Romans 16. Um, uh, with some it says, uh, so-and-so who has worked hard among you, and, um, and that language is, it almost always means ministerial work. Um, we have some uh, evidence of uh, uh, itinerant women missionaries, with, especially with their husbands, Prisca and Aquila, and Junia and Andronicus, those are two missionary couples who are named. We have um, the local um, people who, uh, women in local house churches who were founders of house churches and maintained them with hospitality. And being a founder of a house church or having a house church in your house, in your home, meant that that person was the ordinary leader of prayer. Uh, and a presider at the meals. So there's a real leadership role there with the, 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 in the local situations as well. So I think Paul was um, quite happy with the number of women that he had um, alongside him in evangelization. Why do you think that the Eastern Mediterranean region today does not have a strong Catholic presence as it did in the early centuries? Well, first of all, um, Catholic, uh, um, I guess I would say Christian, uh, um, because in the Eastern um, Mediterranean, the way Christianity developed was always different from the Western Christianity. And so uh, we're really talking about um, Byzantine uh, and, and later Orthodox Christianity, which was, of course, all over the place uh, until uh, the, the 600s and the, um, the Islamic conquest, which took, um, took its time. I mean, it was in the Far East, and then it was not until 1453 that they actually took Constantinople, so it was a long process. And uh, like any smart conquerors, they, they didn't slash and burn. What they did was to give favor to those who converted to Islam. If you wanted to get into the best schools, if you wanted to get the best jobs, etc., um, you had to be Muslim. And, and that process uh, eventually reduced the presence of Christianity to very small numbers, who are still there today, as you know. Um, and the, the Catholics who are in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially in um, Syria, Palestine, that area, are, have only been there since the Crusades, uh, the reintroduction of, of Western Catholicism. So, um, you know, it's a whole process of historical sources, of historical reasons. Was Paul ever married, and did he have any children or brothers or sisters? Um, that's an interesting question. I think Paul was married at one time. I, I don't think he was when he's writing 1 Corinthians 7 because that's about marriage and celibacy and five times in that chapter he says, but I think you'd be happier if you were like me. And I think the only way to interpret that is that he's single at that point. However, if he was an up-and-coming young Pharisee, it's quite likely that he was married um, earlier and he could have been, by the time he writes 1 Corinthians, either widowed or divorced. Divorce was commonly practiced. So it could have been uh, one or other. So my supposition is that he was married at one time, but then he isn't anymore when he's in his itinerant missionary phase. And of course he says also in 1 Corinthians 9, don't I have a right to take with me a, a, a sister woman, literally, which would mean a, a, a wife who is a Christian, a believer, like Cephas and the other apostles. So it seems as if most of them did travel with their wives, and if they're traveling with their wives, probably with their families, unless they're all, you know, empty nesters. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so Paul seems to have been an exception uh, 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 in that regard at the time that he's an, a, a missionary, an itinerant missionary. 
Is there an urgency in the Catholic Church to evangelize in the streets, at pubs, by internet, radio, and other means? Uh, what was the fourth word? Is there a what? Is there an urgency? Urgency. Within the Catholic Church hmm. to, evan to evangelize? Well, some people certainly think so. And, uh, and I think there is because that's the medium of communication for, um, for young people. And whether we like it or not, we might not think it's very healthy, but, but that is, that's the way it works. And uh, the, uh, some dioceses are getting into that. There's eternal word television, you know, which, um, which has been going for some time and actually was a very smart move. Um, and these, um, these websites like XT3, you really ought to check out XT3 if you don't know it. Um, it, it you know, the Pope really does leave messages there for, for young people. Uh, and as I said, it was, what's the, I think I said 40,000 members in 200 countries. I mean, it, it's an enormous thing. And so I think there is an, inert, an urgency. And those of us who are a bit more old fuddy duddies and not quite used to that medium don't perhaps feel the urgency the way it is. The question appears to be perhaps why you don't think that Paul was an ap epileptic. Why I don't think Paul is an epileptic? I didn't say okay. either way. Um, I didn't think so, but that's what it appeared to be. But. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. I'm sorry. <laughs> if Paul did not intend his letters for future readers, then how is it possible for them to be applicable to us nowadays? Mm. Um, good literature does that, for one thing. Um, um, why are some pieces of literature considered classics? They're also written for their own time and place. And yet we find something universal in them that, is, that responds to the desires and the hopes of other people. Now, of other people later on in other situations. And so even on a literary level, you could look at it that way. But then, of course, we have the formation of canon and the formation of New Testament as, as scripture. And so we come at these letters and other pieces of the New Testament with the eyes of faith. And we, we see that Paul is dealing with some of the, the, the basic questions of human existence and, and the basic questions of faith. There are some situations like meat sacrifice to idols in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 that would not be relevant now. Uh, and yet the issue there is cultural accommodation. And the issue of cultural accommodation continues to be relevant. On a, I guess a more personal note, uh, kind of a, um, a request to uh, your comments about uh, Paul's uh, comments about thorns uh, in my flesh. Hmm. Like, what do I mean, what, what do I think he means by yes. that? Yeah, it's in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says that um, he was given this, real, the translation really should be stake in the flesh. A stake is bigger than a thorn. It's not, ouch. Um, the word that's used there, scallops, is a military term for a stake. Um, that sharp, with sharp ends that were implanted at an angle on the other side of a, of a mound of dirt so that when the enemy came running up or charging over the mound of dirt, they would fall onto the stakes. That's, that's the word he uses there. And he says he was given this stake in the flesh um, and that it was very troublesome to him and three times he asked for it to be removed. And the answer was no, because strength is at its best in weakness. And therefore, he says, I will glory in my weakness. There are all kinds of speculations about what that, that stake in the flesh is. Some say it's simply his concern, this, this daily anxiety for all the churches. I think it has something to do with these other accusations that come just two chapters before that about his being very impressive from a distance but not so impressive up close you know, that I said earlier. And I think it was something that made him less impressive as a speaker. Could have been some physical disfigurement, 
could have been uh, some kind of a speech defect, like a stutter, something like that. Uh, and, uh, I, but you know, I don't know specifically. Some think it was uh, an eye ailment, an eye problem. Um, I do think it was something that kept it, that that was a hindrance to effectiveness in his person, in his personal presentation, and that could have been why he went to writing letters so much, you know. Uh, and and it's something that that he struggled with and came to this understanding that. Uh, God was able to work through him, not only in spite of this, but perhaps because of it. If Paul was an anti-hero, how come his evangelization was successful and carried out until today? Yeah, that, that use of anti-hero, I said that only in one specific situation, um, and that's in the um, Clementine romances these second, third century novels. Um, but he was an anti-hero for, for, for others as well, I think. He was not, he was an anti-hero for those who wanted this movement to remain very much within Israel. There's an expression we use, Jewish Christianity. We don't really know what we mean by that. Um, or Christian Judaism. Uh, referring to those people who were ethnically Jews, who believed, Jews for Jesus really, you know, who believed in Jesus as Messiah. They wanted to continue being everything that they already were with this added dimension. And for some generations they did. There's even some mention of them uh, in the early fourth century. So these groups, continued for some time, but they were a dying breed. And for those people, Paul was an anti-hero because of his establishment of a theological reasoning for why law observance, ritual law observance was no longer necessary. So it made Judaism seem passe. And, and I think the reason he came up with this theological uh, solution, theological explanation, was because he was seeing the numbers of non-Jewish persons who were demonstrating faith in Jesus and didn't want to become Jews, didn't want to go through the whole ritual law. And so he was the person who was able to provide a theological foundation for that, for a, a movement that was inevitable, it was already happening. And uh, historians still talk about how and when that happened. We call it the parting of the ways. The parting of the ways, what, at what point was, was the division neatly done already? And some want to say in the second century, by the middle of the second century, you, be, you, begin, you begin to get Christian writers who are hostile to Judaism, who write tra uh, tractates ad versus Judeos, against the Jews, arguing that Judaism got it all wrong in the first place, you know, and we're the ones who really have it right. Um, it's also been argued that, that the parting of the ways was not clean even in the fourth century because somebody like uh, John Chrysostom is, who is the great preacher, Christian preacher in Antioch, who is complaining constantly about his parishioners who go to Jewish services. Now, why would they do that? Um, one, one sociologist, in fact, has argued it's because their relatives are in the, in the Jewish services. <laughs> you see, that, that, that it hasn't really cleanly happened yet. So anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little off the subject, but... Um, uh, Paul is Paul is the one who was able to put a voice to this movement that was moving people uh, away from Israel, away from Judaism, and, and it's for those people that he's an anti-hero. For, uh, for those who accepted what he had to say and those who were part of that movement, and, and for the Gentiles for whom this is good news, I mean, he's very much a hero. Uh, 
one last. Catholic, Catholic uh, scholars suggest that uh, we should treat our treat letters of Paul as really the only authentic letters. Do you agree? As the only authentic letters of what? I guess uh, of Paul. Of Paul, yeah. As yeah. opposed to um, you know writings of uh, say Luke, uh, Acts of the Apostles. Well, well, Luke is is something else. I mean, you know, that's that's another author there, Luke and Acts of the Apostles. But let me just say something maybe about the Pauline corpus, because there are 14 letters in the Pauline corpus, and Hebrews, which is at the tail end, uh, you know, even Origen in the third century said Paul didn't write this. Whoever wrote Hebrews, only God knows. You know? um, so we we tack Hebrews on, but that's not really that's not Paul. No way. Um, However, in the early church, and really, really until around mm, 1780 or so, or 1790, um, the belief was that all the other 13 were written by Paul. And it's, it's modern biblical scholarship that has said, no, look, there are too many differences here. And has, uh, has posed the, um, the proposition, which I agree with, that uh, Paul did not write Colossians or Ephesians or First and Second Timothy or Titus. That you have two different traditions there, Colossians and Ephesians. There's literary dependence of Ephesians on Colossians. And then First and Second Timothy and Titus really seem to be reflecting a different um, situation, a different church situation. I won't go into detail, but you can point out ways in which th there are things said there that seem diametrically opposed to what Paul says in, in earlier letters. So, um, so I would say that, that um, those letters are not written by Paul. They are, however, in the Pauline tradition, in the Pauline corpus. They're canonical. Um, they're in the Bible, and they're beautiful, and they have uh, great things to say to us. Um, but if you're trying to, to define, the, if you're trying to look at the historic Paul, historical Paul, it doesn't help to look at those letters. Now, something else that's very interesting is that um, that since the Reformation, Protestantism really has read Paul through Romans. Uh, Romans and to some extent Galatians. Catholicism has read Paul through the pastoral epistles, through First and Second Timothy and Titus. And that's one of the reasons for the, the, the gaps, the differences in the, in the perception of Paul. And now, uh, you know, in more recent years, there's, there's a big mingling and coming together. I mean, that difference is not so much there anymore. But that really was part of the, the, the differences in our reading of Paul, because we really were coming at it through, from different perspectives. That's it? Any other questions from the floor? Who's, who's speaking? Yes. Um, now, first of all, he didn't come into any non-religious society. There were no non-religious societies in, in, in the uh, ancient Mediterranean, um, in most of the ancient world. Um, every society had its own religious systems. But Acts actually portrays this um, coming, uh, Paul and, and his companions, because he never traveled alone. You know, he always had somebody with him. And they worked in teams, and they would arrive, um, they're, they're Jewish, and so they do what every Jew Jewish traveler would do, they look up the synagogue and the Jewish community. Every ethnic group did that. Uh, they, they would see if there were people from their place in this city where they were coming, and that's where they would find hospitality, and that's where they would find friendship. So they would do that. And Paul uh, soon it was realized that he was a very learned person, learned in, in the law and learned in Judaism. So when they went to the synagogue on Sabbath, he would be invited to say a few words. And he would say a few words. Um, so he would uh, begin to preach Jesus based on the scriptures, you see? And, uh, and the scriptures are the Old Testament. So he would present this as something growing out of what they already knew. 
And some people would be interested to hear more and some people wouldn't at all. And those who were interested to hear more, they would set a time and a place, another time and place to meet. And they would talk again, you know, and he would talk more. And eventually they would form the basis of a, of a house church. So it's it, the, the primary, oh, and I should say, remember there are many Gentiles who go to the synagogues. It's not only Jews. There are Gentiles. Uh, Acts talks about them. They call them the God-fearers. They're Gentiles who are attracted to the monotheism and the ethical system of Judaism. And often, you see, it was they who wanted to hear more. And that's part of that movement, you know, into the Gentiles away from the Jews. So, um, so for the most part, that would be the way it was done. And then they would attract their neighbors and, you know, now, Acts 17 gives us an, another story in um, Athens. This is the Areopagus speech, you know, uh, where uh, Paul is walking around in Athens at the Areopagus in the public areas, and he sees an altar that says, um, Agnosto Theo, to an unknown God. And he, from there, he, he, people are around, and, and he says, this God that you don't know, I know. <laughs> And from there, you see, launches into it. And this speech in, uh, in Athens is a quite philosophical speech. It doesn't sound like Paul. Remember that Luke is writing his story. Uh, he's telling his story. And it, it sounds uh, like a, a philosopher talking, which, you know, would be the appropriate way to do it in Athens. Uh, and um, he's going along fine until he mentions the resurrection of the dead, and then they say, oh, forget it, you know, and they walk away. Um, but but that's one story, you know. The the, um, the the starting out at the synagogue would be the normal way, and it would be very much f based on the scriptures. Um, there were certain texts. I think these people carried with them a little bag of of texts. Uh, you know, a, a whole Bible would be too heavy to carry, but um, they they would carry little texts, and they also knew them by heart. One of the key texts is Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at your right hand. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool or put your enemies under your feet. So the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Um, that was understood to be a messianic text. That God is saying initially to David and to the Davidic king, but, but the interpretation was already there that this was a messianic text. And... Uh, and that, that God was saying it to the Messiah. So, where is Jesus? At the right hand of God. Where does Stephen see Jesus at the moment of his death when he's being stoned? I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. See? So, it, that's an example of, of the kind of text that they would use. And, um, and these are to people who believe that these are inspired texts. And so they're saying... This is the real meaning. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy now with Jesus. All of the texts that you have in, in the Gospels, for instance, in Matthew, this happened in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. You know, um, Matthew's doing that. He's, he's bringing out texts from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures, which are their scriptures, and saying, now we have the real meaning. There was another one over here, yeah. I thought it was very interesting, sister, that you said that Paul was uh, the child of slaves. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it brought to mind the letter of Philemon. Mm -hmm. uh, could you, that's such a powerful mm -hmm. letter, as well as sometimes a, a, a most misunderstood letter. Mm -hmm. Could you take just a couple of moments and maybe delve into that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, first of all, it's important to establish that, that slavery, which was all over the ancient Mediterranean world, was not connected at, at all uh, to race or ethnicity. Um, and anybody could be enslaved. And slaves did not look different from anybody else. They didn't dress differently, um, for the most part. I mean, I'm not talking about the galleys, you know, the, the Ben-Hur kind of thing and all of that. But. So... Um, Philemon is this letter, the letter to Philemon is this little gem that's 22, 24, something like the verses. And um, um, Paul is writing to the head of a house church, 
there are three people, Philemon, Archippus, and um, Apphia, a woman. And so we don't know how those three are related, but they're, they're the sort of leaders of this house church. About uh, a slave named Onesimus. Uh, and there's a play on words that happens in the letter. Onesimus means useful, and, uh, which was a typical slave name. And um, Paul is writing to, um, it, it seems, was. By the fourth century, the interpretation is that Onesimus has run away, that he's a runaway slave and somehow has connected with Paul who is in prison at the time and wasn't, a, wasn't baptized before, but Paul baptizes him in prison and then writes this letter to Philemon saying, He's coming back to you, you know, take him back. It's not clear whether he wants Philemon to manumit Onesimus or not. Probably so, because he says, take him back no longer as a slave, but as a beloved brother. So probably he, he uh, wants him to manumit him. Now that's the traditional interpretation, that, that, he, that Onesimus is a runaway slave. There are two other interpretations that have been, for, but been put forward within the last 20 years. One, which I don't think is persuasive, is that Onesimus is not a slave at all. He is, in fact, Philemon's brother. And Paul is saying, stop treating your brother like a slave. Um, that one I don't find persuasive. But the other one is interesting. Um, Peter Lampe uh, in Germany got onto a, a legal text that says that a slave who goes, who leaves without permission, goes AWOL, but goes to, it is, is in a difficulty with his or her uh, owner, master, mistress, leaves and goes to a third party to mediate the difference, is not to be considered a, a runaway. And that kind of fits very interestingly, that, that Onesimus could be in trouble with, with Philemon and he goes to Paul um, as, a, uh, to, as a mediator, and what Paul is writing is his mediation, his intervention in the, the difficulty between the two of them. So, um, does that answer what you wanted? Uh, yes, it did. Uh, Mr. Weatherington was, was with us last week, mm -hmm. and he gave his interpretation of it, so I just wanted to sort of hear what, what your interpretation of the letter of Philemon. What was his, do you remember? The traditional one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the majority opinion, yeah. I mean, that's what people, native Greek speakers, just a few centuries later came up with, and so, might be right. Anything else? Yes. Sure. Uh, there has been a tendency, in, at least in some circles, to say that it took a couple of generations of Christians to come to a sort of high Christology that John, the latest gospel is the example, and that already Luke is moving in that direction, but that the original people who knew Jesus didn't see it that way. You made the point, I think, quite persuasively, but briefly, that there's a, an amazing sort of high Christology in Paul. Could you comment on that? I don't think I said high Christology. I, mean, I think I said uh, Christology was important to Paul, uh, yeah. Um, Christology, like, like all theology, it, it took some time to develop. Hmm? And the, the highest Christology, you know what I mean by high Christology? It, um, okay, high Christology means heading toward divinity, you know, that, that Jesus is God, or already there. Low Christology means uh, Jesus is um, Messiah, um, uh, what else? Um, exalted one, um, important teacher, etc. Um, Christology it took a while to develop, and the highest Christology in the New Testament is John. John probably is saying that uh, that Jesus is the pre. Well, he is pre. He's clearly saying Jesus is preexistent, or Christ. The Logos is preexistent. I mean, Jesus isn't preexistent because Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth. He was born, you know, <laughs> conceived and born. But um, that, that the logos, the word of God, 
is pre-existent and probably, uh, you know, in the beginning was the word. What does that mean? I mean, in the beginning sounds like there was a beginning. You know, we can go round and round on the words because we don't really have words for that. So, um, so maybe John is saying that, that the Logos um, existed from all eternity as God. Paul's not saying that. Paul I I is saying that, um, that Jesus is, or, and, and Christ is the uh, exalted Lord, the one who sits at God's right hand, um, the one who is next to the throne, the one who is the next best thing to God. Um, the one who is who participates in the power of God in a unique way, and that's what "son of God" means in uh, in a first-century context. Um, it's like "son of man." It's like "son of sons of light and sons of darkness." Um, someone who participates, who belongs to the realm of, and so. Um, so son of God means someone who has a unique relationship to God. Uh, it, it, even John, however, I don't think has the, the fully developed Christology that would come in the third century and then into the fourth century with the Arian controversy and the, the clarification of the Council of Nicaea. After that, you have a full-blown um, high Christology. So, so it's something that's developmental. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, somebody else going to the... Just a question. Uh, the word in Greek, Kyrios, mm -hmm. used for Lord when Paul refers to Jesus. Yeah. And the Greek translation of the Old Testament using Kyrios for God. Mm -hmm. Some people saying that Paul was saying that Jesus was God by using the word Kyrios. Mm -hmm. Could you clari clarify that? Yeah, that argument really doesn't hold up. Uh, that, was, that was made early in the 20th century and, um, and that argument really doesn't hold up because Kyrios is a word that can mean everything from, it, it's the word used for God in the Hebrew scriptures sometimes, in the, Septu the, the Greek translation, it means everything from that to sir. When you want to address a man with respect, you say Kyrie. If you get on an Olympic Airlines plane today, when they begin the announcements, Kyrie Kikiris, gentlemen and ladies, they do it in that order, um, it, it's the same word. So you have to understand it in context, you see? And it is true that in, in the uh, Greek Old Testament, um, it's the word that, that substitutes for, uh, when the Hebrew uses Adonai, which is a substitute for the tetragrammaton, for the, you know, for the name of God, um, the, the, the Greek usually uh, substitutes Kyrios. But um, to call someone Kyrios, that, 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 that Christ, that um, Jesus or Christ is the exalted Lord, the exalted Kyrios, means it's a title of great respect. And, and I think he's saying in context that, that uh, Christ holds a, a position that no one else does. It's a unique position, but it doesn't hold up that that means God. 